have some other good ones that I'll save for another sermon. So changing gears a little bit, we're going to come back to um, back to some of those ideas. But um, this week, uh, I found out. Oh, by the way, we're going to be um, we're going to be in he continuing in, in Hebrews. Um, those of you that I know that sometimes pick up a, a large print copy of the passage we're going to look out, there was not one. Um, there was not one there uh, because this week we're kind of going to be looking through uh, about four chapters in Hebrews. So I didn't want to print all of that out. So um, perhaps this is just a good Sunday to just listen. Uh, if you normally read along, because we're going to be kind of skipping around and hitting a, a few passages um, uh, throughout Hebrews seven through through ten. Uh, so that's a, that's a warning there. Um, uh, but this week, uh, this week I found out uh, a really fascinating bit of, I guess you could say trivia, um, that I did not know, and uh, honestly probably never would have would have guessed. You know those uh, those giant redwood trees out in the like in California in the western part of the U.S. Those gigantic redwood trees. Has anyone ever been to visit them? Anybody? A few people. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, they can grow. They can grow up to uh, it's about 350 feet tall. Uh, they can weigh up to about 500 tons, uh, and they can live upwards of 2,000 years. I read somewhere uh, that uh, they are actually um, possibly the oldest, can be the oldest living thing uh, on on planet Earth, right? And um, none of that, by the way, is the bit of trivia that surprised me. And I had kind of heard that about those those trees. But here's what surprised me: their roots. These 2,000-year-old, 500-ton, 350-feet-tall trees, do their roots are only about an inch or so thick, and they only go down about 5 or 10 feet. Anybody know that? I found that out this week. Right? Think about that. These gigantic trees have these small roots that don't go down very deep at all. So, so the question is, how are these towering trees supported by such tiny roots? Well, they do it because the roots, down just a little bit underground, what they do is the roots spread out. And rather than going down deep, they spread out wide and they interlock with all the other roots of all the other redwood trees that are around them. They spread out, the roots spread out something like 80 to, to 100 feet from the tree uh, that, they're, that, they're the root, that they're the roots of, and they interlock with all those other roots from all the trees in that redwood forest. And so the result of this is that, is, result is this beautiful, time-withstanding, majestic forest that is just something that is, that is breathtaking and astounding to behold, all because these roots from this interlocking system. So we have come, in our series going through the book of Hebrews, we have come to, as I said earlier, we've come to a long section, uh, chapter 7 through 10. And again, before you get nervous, like I said, we're not, we're not going to read all four of these chapters. We're just going to look at a few selections from them. Because much like those giant redwood trees and those redwood forests, what is going on in these chapters is a weaving and an interlocking of images, pictures, and examples, and, and comparisons that are all pointing us to this one eternal, beautiful, majestic, breathtaking, and astounding to behold truth about Jesus Christ, about what he has done, and about who he therefore is for us. Then we're going to look a little bit at how this truth about Jesus, how it calls and leads and encourages us to respond. And so this section of Hebrews is centered around one main theological theme, and that is that Jesus is our eternal great high priest. Just as an aside here, um, what, it, what it does is it paints a picture of how Jesus, is, how his life, and death, and resurrection brings about salvation, redemption, uh, 
But this picture that Hebrews is painting is just itself one facet, one way to see and understand the work of Christ. There are other places in Scripture uh, that bring out different angles and different pictures and different, different ways to understand, different facets um, that when woven together, they give us an even uh, far more beautiful image of the great jewel that is the life and work of Christ. And here, we're going to get one of those facets, one of those ways that looking at, at Jesus Christ and what he has done. So as I said, we're not going to read all four of these chapters. We're just going to pull out some of the passages to get, a, to get an idea, and then we're going to get to where all of this leads us. Um, but I didn't want you to feel shortchanged this morning. Uh, so what I did, as you'll notice in the bulletin, uh, I put an outline of these chapters. Uh, you can take it home. Um, this should give you some good structure to, to look at these four chapters, maybe uh, go back to them this week and spend some time reading chapters 7 through 10 of Hebrews. Uh, and that outline should help you, help you follow the flow and get a, a deeper and, and more in-depth look at, what's, at all the intricacies of what's going on here. Okay, so let's, um, let's pray as we go to God's Word. Lord, for, um, for your scripture, for your word to us this morning, we give you thanks. We pray that your spirit would fill us, fill this place, that as we, as we hear and meditate on, on your word and on the, the truth that it proclaims about who you are, Lord, that it would take root in our hearts and in our lives, that knowing being assured of who you are for us, we may go and live lives accordingly, according to the calling that you have given each and every one of us. Open our eyes this morning to who you are and who we are called to be. In Christ's name, amen. So we're going to begin uh, with Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verses well, 1 through 3. This King Melchizedek, of Solomon, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned one tenth of everything. His name in the first place means King of Righteousness. Next, he is also King of Solomon, that is, King of Peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God. He remains a priest forever. So we begin this part of Hebrews with this mysterious figure, Melchizedek. Does anyone remember hearing his name? His name has popped up um, over the past few weeks here, here and there. He's this, Melchizedek is this mysterious figure who's been name dropped a few times, and now we're going to find out why. See, Melchizedek is a king. And he's a priest. But he's mentioned almost in passing just twice in the Old Testament. He's mentioned in Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20. And he's mentioned then again in one verse in Psalm 110. Back in Genesis, uh, we're back in the time of, of Abram, who, who later gets known, of, uh, known as, as Abraham. Um, some stuff has happened. And Abram's nephew Lot... Uh, along with some other people, they've been captured in a war between two, these two groups of kings. And so Abraham gathers a bunch of people, and he goes to rescue Lot and everyone else. And that's when this enigmatic Melchizedek shows up in Scripture. Genesis 14, uh, verses 17 through 20. After his, Abram's, return from the defeat of Cadolaroma, the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, of Sodom, went out to meet him, Abram, at the valley of Shavah, that is the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Solomon brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. That is the first and last that we hear about Melchizedek in the histories. That's it. 
He shows up out of nowhere as a king and a priest. Uh, we don't even know how he became a priest of God, but there he is. He blesses Abram, and, and then Abram gives a, gives a tithe to him. And that's it. We don't know anything more about this guy, Melchizedek. And so what happened is that he's just this mysterious figure that is somehow not just a king. Uh, the name Melchizedek means the king is righteous or, or king of righteousness or something along those lines. He's also a priest. Even though he has nothing to do with the, the genealogical line of priests, the, the Levites that will come later from Abram's offspring. There he is, a priest, the most high God. He has the ability to bless Abram and receive a tithe from him. And so as the generations go by, from Abram on, God ordains the priesthood for his people, those, those that are descendants of, of Levi, who was was a great-grandson of, of Abram, later called Abraham, and those priests are now the, the ones, they're the people who are to, uh, to be the priests of God's people, to, to give the offerings and sacrifices to God on behalf of the people. That's what God sets up. They're the ones who can receive the tithes of the people. They're the only ones that can go into the holiest of, of places in the temple on behalf of the people. They're the only ones that can make atonement for sin on behalf of the people. All of that will come later after Abraham. And we should be clear, because it's easy, uh, sometimes we look at that and we say, that was all wrong. But we need to be clear that that system of priests and, and their priestly duties, none of that was bad. It, in fact, was good and holy and a means of grace for God's people. It was precisely what God set up. It was there for a holy and sacred purpose, not just to be the, the means of atonement for the people, but also to point to God's ultimate promises for his people. But all this while, that is the centuries going down the line that that is going on. There's this mysterious figure of Melchizedek lurking in the background of the biblical consciousness of God's people. This, this king and this priest of of God that comes out of nowhere, that prefigures all of these other priests, that shows up without any word about his human history or his genealogy. And so, so what happened throughout the years is that the people kind of latched on to Melchizedek and the, and the fact that in addition to not knowing where he came from, there's no word about his death either. So, so he becomes kind of in this in the, the legendary background of the people becomes this almost allegory, this, it's not quite the right word, he's more of a, a figure that points to the idea of an eternal priesthood. And so the only other place that he shows up is in Psalm 110, verse 4. This is the psalm that begins, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now that may sound familiar because that's a psalm that Jesus quotes to show that he is the Messiah. And it's later in that same psalm, it's the only other time Melchizedek comes up, where it says this, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so all of this, I know, I know this is, we're talking about this weird enigmatic figure, but all of this, this mysterious priest, that his name is popped up throughout Hebrews. He's not from the tribe of Levi, but instead somehow he prefigures a forever priest. This is the person that the, the preacher of Hebrews grabs onto, this strange, barely mentioned guy from, from the Old Testament. The preacher of Hebrews here grabs onto him, Melchizedek, not to give us more historical information about Melchizedek, to dive deeper into who Jesus is. And so he uses Melchizedek over these chapters here in Hebrews to build up a comparison between the old order of priests and sacrifices to the new of, of Jesus, our forever high priest. Jesus not so much as, a, as just a replacement, but a fulfillment of what the old ways were always pointing to. And so all through chapters 7, 8, 9, and, and the first part of 10, what's going on here 
is it's a tapestry or, or it's, a, it's a weaving in and out of, of the comparisons of the, of the old and now the new that shows up in Jesus Christ. And new not so much in, as something completely different, but new really in this, this sense of the reality that is behind the example that came before. How Jesus is the eternal high priest, the once and for all and forever high priest that fulfills everything that that old priesthood was pointing to and was a shadow or an echo of. And so when you look at that outline that I put in the bulletin, you don't have to look now, but when you, when you do look, chapter 7 and 8 begin with using this figure of Melchizedek as our entry point into this world of priests and sacrifices. And then there's this weaving in and out and back and forth of these, these images of the, of the old and the new, the, the old order of priests having to go back again and again each and every year offering sacrifice after sacrifice because of our sin. It's a reminder of how sin can so easily trap us in the past, right? Having to keep going back again, again, again. And then that's compared with the new of Jesus, the great high priest who's once and for all sacrificed because he himself the eternal Son of God. He is eternal and everlasting, and so His sacrifice is likewise eternal and everlasting. The old order of the, of the high priest entering, in, entering every year into the holiest of holy places to encounter God on behalf of the people, and now the new of Jesus who has entered into the holy place once and for all, so that through Him all of us not just those select few, but all of us. And not just once every so often, but all of us at all times through Jesus are invited, are invited into to live and move and breathe in the very presence of God with no barrier, no sin or otherwise that can, that can separate us. The old order of priests who themselves have to have their own sin atoned for before they can even think about offering sacrifices on behalf of all the rest of us. And now the new of Jesus, the great high priest who has no sin of his own, and can therefore offer all that he, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, all that he is, offered for and on behalf and to you. Jesus is the great high priest because he does not just offer the sacrifice. Family, he is the sacrifice for you, for me, indeed for this very world. So what this whole section of Hebrews is about, again, it is well worth going in and looking at it in detail, right? But, but the thrust of, of what all of this is pointing to is that all, that, all of that that came before the system of priest and sacrifice and, and mediation between us and God, Jesus has come to fulfill all of it. To be the great high priest that the other older order was always just a shadow of. It was meant to be a in the meantime type, an echo maybe is, is how we could best think of it echo that would give way eventually to the reality behind it all. And Jesus is that reality. Jesus is the great high priest. So listen to chapter 9, beginning in verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the sketches of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves need better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with the blood that is not his own. But as it is, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the age, to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
Family, the point here is that Jesus is your great high priest who has no beginning and no end. He is your great high priest who has no need to also make atonement for his sin as all human priests do. So he can offer once and for all sacrifice, all sacrifices to you, for you. Jesus is our great high priest who sacrifice, unlike that of all human priests, his sacrifice is eternal. And there is no more need to keep going back again and again and again in the same old patterns because he is eternal and he is not just the one offering the sacrifice, but he is in fact the one who is the sacrifice. And so the atonement made the forgiveness that is offered, the redemption that is received, is in itself eternal and forever. It is assured and it is secure. And whereas human priests entered into that holy of holies in the temple, entered into the, the presence of God once a year on behalf of the people and then returned, Jesus, our great high priest, has entered once for all, that we, all of us, who are united in, in Christ through his life, and through his death, and through his resurrection, if you are united in Christ and with Christ, if you are in Christ through faith, through trusting in him and in his person and work on your behalf, we are united with him in the very presence of God, without shame, without guilt. Because Jesus, God himself, is our great high priest. All that needs to be done for you, for us, for anyone to draw near to God. Not in fear and worry, but in faith and love. Jesus has done all of that. He's done all that needs to be done once and for all. He has fulfilled his come before. So it is here. After three and a half chapters of, of weaving in and out the old and the new, after we get all of these images and comparisons drawing out this point, these, these interlocking roots that then burst out in, into this beautiful, majestic, eternal, astounding to behold truth of who Jesus is for you and for us and for this world. We come at the end of this section of Hebrews to what I think is one of the greatest words that pops up throughout Scripture. It's in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, and the word is therefore. Such a great word. Therefore, all forgiveness has been made. All redemption has been won. Jesus is your great, eternal, once and for all high priest. Chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, therefore, my friends, Brothers, sisters, therefore, since we have con confidence to enter the sanctuary, to enter into the very presence of God, by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, therefore, let us approach the true heart, the full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I mean, did you get that? Jesus is our great, eternal, once and for all high priest. Therefore, let us approach God with a true heart, trusting in God's promises. There need not be worry anxiety because all that is necessary has been done. 
to approach in true heart, trusting in God's promises. Therefore, let us hold fast to the confession. What? Of our hope. For God is faithful. Therefore, let us consider how to provoke one another to what? To love and good deeds. Encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us therefore draw near to God, knowing that God is faithful. Encouraging one another because in Jesus Christ, our great high priest, God himself, has drawn near. And indeed, he is drawing near to us. So let us, in faith and hope, provoke one another more and more to love and good deeds. And do you know what all of that is? All of those therefores? Do you know what they're describing? It's saying, because Jesus is our great high priest, that is, that, that we, as his people, as people following after him, it's, what this is, is a picture of the old Reformation doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. And it's us, all of us now, being priests, priests with a lowercase p, for one another. Encouraging one another in faith, reminding one another of the promises of God, pointing one another to the assurance that we have in Jesus Christ, and therefore calling, strengthening, encouraging one another, encouraging each other to live as such a people who have such a great high priest. To live as a people who standing before God Himself is assured certain, encouraging and calling one another, provoking one another to live as a people who are called, claimed, and redeemed in Jesus Christ, knowing all that is necessary has already been done on your behalf, that all atonement for sin has been made, that all forgiveness has been offered, that all redemption has been won. So now, therefore, Live as a people changed and formed by the once for all work of God Himself. To provoke, reminding, provoking, pushing, pulling, strengthening one another to love and good deeds. That is our calling as people who have such a great high priest. When you have the assurance of who Jesus is for you and for us and for this world, you are free. Family, we are free to live into that goodness. Not to be bound by the sins of the past, but to live into the goodness that God offers in Jesus Christ. To, to boldly repent and turn away from all those old ways. Because they have already been dealt with. Therefore, to turn toward the love and the good works that God calls us to. Family, when we know and trust in that, when we take root in Jesus Christ, our great high priest, free to approach God in full assurance of who we are in Christ, holding fast to the confession of our hope, and when we therefore, like those great redwoods, allow our roots in Christ to come together, locking in together, being there for one another, being small letter P priests for one another, as we point each other to our great once and for all capital letter P priest, Jesus Christ, and the life that he has loved us into, we and, and our faith and the proclamation of this gospel, and the very lives that we lead, this profoundly good news of Jesus, Family, this is what it means to be called into the family of God. This is what it means to have such a high priest. Jesus is your great high priest. He is our great high priest. 
Therefore, let us approach God without fear or anxiety, but rather with a true heart and full assurance. Jesus is our great high priest. Therefore, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, for he who has promised is faithful. Jesus is our great high priest. Therefore, family, let us consider, explore, let us focus on how to provoke one another, how to challenge one another, how to lead one another to love and good deeds. Not neglecting to meet together, but instead encouraging one another and all the more to see the day approaching. Jesus is our great high priest. <coughs> Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us draw near to God and to one another, living as those who are near to God and one another. In Jesus Christ, we have a great high priest, and God himself has drawn and is drawing near to you, and to us. Jesus is your, he is our great high priest. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us live as such a people. Let's pray. Lord, what an awesome, beautiful, astounding thing it is to know that you are our great high priest, that Jesus has come to fulfill all that is necessary, to be not just the one offering the sacrifice, but the one who is himself the sacrifice, giving himself that all that is his may be ours, that we may draw near to you, in full confidence and assurance that we may know that the hope we have in you is secure and that we may therefore live as your people provoking one another to love and good deeds being priests for one another reminding each other pointing each other to the gospel to the good news of Jesus Christ and to who we are called Claim to be in him. Lord, may we be such a people, for we have such a great high priest in Christ. Amen. <clears throat>